Talk To Me with Liv Harrison, the stories behind their success. So I grew up in this small town in Northern Louisiana and I was the only girl. I had three younger brothers. Well, I mean, I still have the brothers, but at the time there were the four of us and my family, my extended family is quite huge. Here's the thing about these guys. They are all ridiculous when it comes to athleticism. Like, I'm not kidding. We're talking about state champions. We're talking about college football players. We're talking about NFL football players. We're talking amazing athletes, scholarships, the whole thing, right? Okay, not me. Like, not so much. Like, like not even kind of a little, like, not even a smidge. My parents were great athletes. My mother won state championships. So did my father track basketball, all the things. I have a brother that won state with lacrosse me, nothing, nada. It's as if Jesus were taking a nap when he was handing that out of the big bag of gifts that he was handing. So I am not an athlete. Okay. And it's fine. I'm not better. I'm totally better. The problem is, is I wanted so desperately to be an athlete. What is really sad is that I tried a lot of things. I'm not going to go into this story very far, but let me just say this. I was the only girl on my all boys soccer team when I was in the third grade. And yes, it is absolutely as horrible as you think it is. So many stories. And I will share them, I promise, but not today. Nothing like being bigger than boys. Let me just say that, okay? I'll, I'll pause there. But with my non-athleticism and this really crazy athletic family that I was born into, I tried all the things. One time, I remember my mother saying, look, I found it. This is going to be it. And at Christmas, I got a pair of roller skates. This seemed promising, right? Because it wasn't just based on me or this is what I thought. Okay, this is how little my little tiny kid brain was working. I was thinking, this is fantastic. There's wheels. It can move. What in the world do I have to do? I put in my foot. This is gold. Okay, horrible. It was so horrible. We lived on a street that was barely paved. I gotta be honest. I mean, really barely paved. And the concrete in the driveway was so uneven, so crazy. That wasn't gonna work. Now there was a roller skating rink close to where I lived in Louisiana. I remember one of my brothers even had a birthday party there. And <laughs> there was this like very awkward, scary looking, I mean, I wanna say Snoopy, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I'm really not sure it was a named costume, but I'm going to go with Snoopy, okay? Which totally shows my age, if anybody knows who Snoopy is. But I thought it was the coolest party ever being at a roller skating rink. We moved not like very long after that. We moved to Houston, Texas. I was around 10 when we moved. It was right before I was 10. It was the summer before fifth grade. What was so great is that everything was closer, including a roller rink. And I loved the roller rink. Did I do well? Nope, not at all. <laughs> I never got good, could never inline skate. I tried. My parents at one point, which again, this is a story I will save, but just a little sneak peek. I got a personal trainer when I was in high school and she tried. Oh my goodness. I think she even like, lit candles, tried, tried to get me to learn how to inline skate. It didn't happen. It's never going to happen. Here's what's funny. A couple of years ago, and I'm not going to say how old I was because, well, that just seems cruel to me. We were having a huge Thanksgiving, or as I like to say, normal Thanksgiving. <laughs> Thanksgiving at my parents' house is an extreme sport. It's a four-day affair. I am not kidding, not even joking. So Thanksgiving happens and there's a lot of sitting around. There's a lot of doing nothing. So I decide for Saturday night, which what Thanksgiving's on a Thursday. So this is what, I don't know, two, three nights later, I decide to invite the world to a roller skating party. Literally, this was like three years ago. People showed up like 60 people came. I'm not kidding. It was phenomenal. First of all, nobody has anything to do on this Saturday after Thanksgiving. Let's be honest. 
So everyone was like, roller skating? That sounds great. So we did. We all went roller skating. All of us. And a lot of us were adults. As in like seasoned adults. As in like not in your 20s. So I'm rolling like rolling around thinking I'm so fantastic. You guys, I fell four times. And when I say fall, I mean wipe the wipe out. Like I wiped out. Here's what's really sad. Two months later, I was in my bathroom and I was getting out of the bathtub, which we have this horrific old bathtub that you have to basically like spelunk into. It is so horrible. Anyway, there's stairs involved. And I missed and I fell. Not only did I fall, I broke my tailbone. (laughs) Sorry. I did. I broke my tailbone. What do I have left to do when I turn 90? I already did it. I'm like, I broke my tailbone in my 30s. Okay. What are you talking about? And you want to know why? Because one of us thought it would be a fantastic idea to go roller skating as an adult after Thanksgiving. It was a horrible idea, but I learned a lesson. And the thing is, is that I learned that You should give up dreams that are not yours to have. I do not belong on skates. What is fantastic is that my guest not only started his life on skates, he belongs on them all the time. His parents just so happened to own the roller rink that I grew up going to here in Houston. And he just so happened to turn into a world champion. And then in his 20s, decided to take it to the ice and became an Olympian. My guest today is my friend who is nothing less than inspiring and an incredible athlete, Chad Hedrick. Hi, Chad. How are you? I'm great. How are you today? (laughs) I'm fantastic. Okay, so you still live where we grew up. Did you always live in this part of Houston, first of all? Did you go, like, were you born and raised in Northwest Houston? So yeah, I was born uh, and grew up there in the Champion Forest area and then moved over to Spring Creek Oaks as I got a little older there <laughs> just in the heart of spring. Yeah, just dad owned the roller rink there and I learned how to <laughs> learn how to roller skate by the, you know, the time I could walk. So you were good at it. <laughs> yeah, I was good at it. I just had a knack for it and absolutely loved it. So I um I just ran with it and, you know, grew up skating. It worked out like, well. Skated like six, eight hours a day, every day. And then- Are you, you know, serious? Yeah. And when I was going through school, like in junior high and in high school- Yeah. You were gone a lot. You would be gone with competitions because you and I ate lunch together in fifth grade. I don't know if you remember that, but we ate at the same table. And then we got to like junior high, high school and you were gone because you had a lot of competitions. You were like- or it seemed that way to me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, Maybe I made uh, that up. you know, I had this abnormal social life growing up just because yeah. of my commitment to what I did. And um, a lot of people didn't really understand it. And to be right. quite honest, uh, you know, I, I could have had uh, quite a few more friends in high school <laughs> if I if I wouldn't have uh, had this going on. And a lot of people really didn't understand. But yeah, my commitment I'm sure. level was there, and uh, it wasn't until years later that people really got to see what I was doing, and you know, kind of uh, the success that was that was wrapped around that. I can't imagine. Like, I, first of all, I think your parents are brilliant because here they had a roller rink, and they were like, "Hey, we can bring our kid to work." It's like that's kind of they were brilliant. I mean, and you just, I mean, obviously you have a God given talent. Obviously. I mean, a lot of us have grown up skating, Chad, and none of us ended up winning medals and traveling the world. So, you know. Yeah. You know, I, by the time I was 20, I've been to 32 different countries with just a, a bag and a pair of skates. And, and that commitment, that dedication that I had um, was absolutely uh, just, it was like horse blinders. I didn't really care about anything else. And I just wanted to be the fastest skater in the world. And I accomplished that feat, and it was just a, an amazing ride with a lot of great experiences. And now, you know, I travel all over the world. I have friends I can pick up the phone and meet them and 
and chat with them and, and go out to dinner with them. I just talked yeah. to uh, one of my friends in Venice this morning. Uh, oh my gosh. In Italy. So, you know, it's been, it's been amazing. It's been incredible. So, okay, here's where I'm interested because I know uh, that you're a very big Christian. I know that your faith is really important to you. Did you grow up with like a really solid faith, especially doing something so public and so different than everybody else? Did you really have to rely on that? Or was that something that you came into later on in your life? Yeah, so I grew up and, you know, this this being a racer in particular, it comes with a lot of pride. Like you're at you're at the starting line, you're looking at everybody else. There's there's no weakness, right? Yeah. So this this really instilled like a posture in me, a very prideful posture where I didn't want to show any weakness and I wanted to get every advantage that I could as I as I started the race. And this, you know, as as much success as I had, it really fed this this animal inside that was all about self, right? And okay. there, and it wasn't like, is Chad gonna win the race? It was normal. It became normal if I won, uh, but then when I lost, Ooh. it was like, what's wrong? You know. So there was a lot of pressure that was put on me that way, and it just built up this this monster um inside and i was not a believer at that point so um, okay you know this this road was a, a slippery slippery slope with a lot of a uh, huh, lot of a <laughs> lot of manipulation a lot of uh, really just using relationships for personal gain and just really just climbing the top and feeding that that pride and it, it got to a point where um I sat atop the podium in 2006 after I won my gold medal in, in Italy, won the first gold medal for our country in Italy. Wow. It was incredible. I was watching. Yeah. And I stood up there and it was a moment that I really should have just really relished. I'd remember times of people jumping up and down, watching the Olympics as a kid people jumping up and down, people smiling, people laughing, people closing their eyes and just just crying and all this stuff. I mean, I'm shaking as I talk to you a little bit with my hands. Yeah. Here, but uh, those memories were what I expected uh, to happen when I won. And I had this empty feeling inside. And wow. it was a time that I realized that my life was defined only by how fast I could go on a pair of skates. Was that moment, the moment you're standing receiving the first gold medal for, it was the Turin Olympics, correct? Yeah, yeah. It was 2006. It. Yeah. And you expected to jump up and to clap and to scream and to cry. And you at that moment felt empty because, wow, Chad. I just felt like, is this really like, what I've dedicated my whole life for is this like, was this the feeling that I was expecting is, was this not to this degree, but like, was it, was it worth it? You know what I mean? It yeah, was like sure. this crazy, crazy feeling. So um, I had this come to Jesus moment, you know, <laughs> at the Olympics, getting a gold medal. I mean, there you go. And I still watch the video and, and that Olympic ceremony, just looking at my face when I'm there on top of the podium. And it's been 14 years now, but I can still look and watch and realize that five seconds where I'm just shaking my head and just like wondering like, whoa, what just happened here? What's missing in my life for me to find fulfillment? Because if this, if this goal that I've focused my whole life on, if it doesn't satisfy my soul, then what really is? That's unbelievable. How old were you in 2006? I was uh, 29 years old. So you're 29 and you're standing there. And so were you able to consciously decipher I'm missing Christ at that moment? Like, did you know it was a spiritual religious thing? You know what I mean? Like that God was what was missing or you just knew something was missing? At that point there, um, I knew something was missing. I didn't know what okay. it was. So I had to you go over. You couldn't name it yet. I, it wasn't like an immediate, like, 
you know, sure. go, go get baptized at a church. Like St. Paul. So, you know, <laughs> it, it was yeah. a moment where I had to reflect and really understand and really diagnose what was going on. And then a lot of things just, just started being very, very clear as to what that road was like leading to that and the things that were exposed to my life that I wasn't even cognizant of. Um, I had 11 Bibles uh, in my home uh, that were all untouched, that were given to me as gifts. Um, mm. I had people around me uh, that, you know, I'd never really looked at them as the religious, I don't want to say religious, but the relationship uh, you know, I, I didn't realize the relationships they had and how that affected the person or people that they were. Um, and I started seeing that I wanted to be that way. I started wow. seeing that the way that my dad raised me to be a racer, to be intense, to show no weakness and to go up and shake people's hands and squeeze it hard and to show that, hey, I'm the boss, you know, this is, this is the guy you have to worry about. I'm the best. And <laughs> I realized that, you know, it, it's kind of weird, but the, really the first thing that happened was uh, my father-in-law um, realizing that everybody in my wife's family, they hugged each other. Wow. And that sense, that loving gesture if you will was something different my parents love me to pieces there's no doubt right but that hug from man to man uh it freaked me out at the beginning <laughs> but <laughs> but it's something it's something that really like took me back and was like um wow. whoa this is this is something that you know kind of opened my eyes and i really just started getting exposed and really investing and in finding out what these additional pieces were that were missing. And shortly after that, a couple of years later, I got baptized at Champion Forest wow. Baptist and it's been, it's been great ever since. It has. So do you, do you give a lot of the credit to your wife? Her name is Lindsay, correct? Yeah, Lindsay. Um, She's beautiful. She seems absolutely adorable. Yeah, thank you. She's been <laughs> such a blessing, but believe it or not, she went to church growing up, uh, and, you know, was raised in a family that had a relationship with God and Jesus. And um, she had never been baptized herself, believe it or not. So we did it together and it was a time Stop. of celebration. That's so cool. You know, what's cool about this story, Chad, is that you can tell that God was pursuing you, even though you didn't know. Like, I love the part about the 11 Bibles in your house that you had an open that were given to you or the people in your life that you didn't really know why, you know, maybe you had them in your life, but it was like as if God were, you know, just kind of just always being there until you were ready, you know? And then he, he like allowed that to happen, which I love. I love that he was so grand about it. He's like, well, wait till the Olympics. Yeah. And, and you know, <laughs> the story that absolutely blows me away is my grandfather. Um, he's gone, he's passed away of course, but years later, one of those Bibles, that he had given me. Um, I picked up a new Bible and I was going to use it. It was a rainbow study Bible, which I really like. And um, I opened up and the first page that I opened up to was John. And there was a post-it note that had been written while he was alive, of course. And he said to read the first two pages of this and I'll understand what life's all about. And what? <laughs> It was Chad. I have goosebumps. That's unbelievable. No, it was it was absolutely crazy. Um, to wow, to years later, just to see that God had me on His heart through other people, and that I wasn't exposed to that until uh, until afterwards. You know, that is absolutely beautiful. That's that is a love story. You know what I mean? Like we. That is like beyond Romeo and Juliet. He was absolutely going after you. And it was at your grandfather had passed when you found the post-it note. Yeah. Several years. After wow. He, several years after he passed away. I, that I is amazing. It. Yeah. Chad, that's unreal. So let me ask you this because you grew up roller skating and you were always competing and doing fantastic. I always thought you were great. And I loved when I would go to the roller rink in our town, which we still go to. Do your parents actually still own the roller rink? Yeah, they okay. do. Yeah. Okay. Well, we still go. I know the last time I saw you was there, but, and I loved watching you. You were amazing then, but at some point 
you had done all the roller skating things you could do. <laughs> like you had done all the things on the planet. When did you decide, you know what? I'm going to ice skate and I'm going to be just as fast because we, let me explain again. We're from Houston. We don't have ice. <laughs> we didn't grow up yeah, you know, in so, Minnesota on lakes. So how did that happen? So it was just a little frustrating. And this is kind of a prideful thing as well. And that goes back to what we were talking about before. But back before I knew Jesus, I wanted the attention to myself. I wanted the notoriety. I wanted the pat on the back for all the time that I had put into my sport. I knew God had given me a special talent, but I wanted that. I wanted fame. I wanted fortune. And that's the human in me, you know, and sure. that, what I didn't really realize before, but all that time I, I had expectations of the respect that people would give me um, in my life because of it. And my sport of inline speed skating, although I was the world champion for 10 straight years, nobody really knew what I did. Yeah, that's fair. And I had to go. And the only way that I could do it was to stand on top of the podium and let billions of people across the world see my talent. And that, that fed, that fed an arrogant, um, an arrogant guy who, you know, I'm not going to say I, I regret a lot of the things that I, that I did then because Partially, that attitude's needed to be the best in the world at, at anything, to be able to push yourself harder than anybody. But at the same time, there was a lot of a lot of things that I go back and wish some of the decisions I made in my life were a little different. But I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't know how good God is if right. it weren't this valley to mountain type story, you know? I love that. Oh, I love that valley to mountain. You never hear that. Yeah, it, it it sounds like it had to be absolutely a part of your journey to get to the appreciation you have appreciation you have for God, which I love how vocal you are on social media about your faith. You know, you did have this incredible, not did, you have this incredible story of your talent. You're still just as talented, but that you're not defined by that. You're this incredible man of God with this beautiful family, this successful business that you have today which I know you do real estate here in Houston and you're killing it. You're amazing. And I love it. And I love that you use your talent from the Olympics with the gold to sold is your whole, you know, mantra and your whole tagline, which I think is really creative. I mean, Chad, you really and truly took all the things that God gave you and you did the best with them. And I don't think anybody's story is linear. You know, I think that's, what's so great about no. your story. I mean, here's the kicker here is that in everybody's life in everybody's life, the highest point that you think you could ever be at may be the moment where God meets you. Wow. That's unbelievable. And you have, you have CEOs, you have athletes, you have, uh, you have people that are the best at what they do. And when it boils down to it, it means absolutely squat unless they have a relationship with Jesus. And that's what I found out because I fed myself. Nobody cared. Everybody cared when I was an athlete, putting the microphone in my face, writing about me in the newspaper. But you know what? That day ended. And guess what? Nobody cares. You're right. just, you're just a normal dude. And all that matters is your character, your morals, what you do to help other people, how you love. And you know what? I'm, I'm not great at all these things, but I'm getting better every day. No. And I think that's, what's so great about this because it's easy to look at you. And this is the whole point of what I'm trying to do. It's easy to look at you and say, Chad Hedrick has it all. He has, Olympic medals, I'll never, I will never have a medal. We all, even in curling, I don't have a chance. Like there's nothing I can do. 
<laughs> you know, so it's easy to look at you, Chad, right? And say, this is what makes him successful. You're successful because of this, because of what you did in your 20s. And you're here saying, that's a lie. <laughs> I'm successful because of my relationship with Christ and because of the man that I grew up to be. Now, that's a part of your story. That doesn't take away your incredible gift of skating, whether it's on the ice or the rink or whatever, you know. But I think that that's what's so beautiful about what you share. I told you I was going to ask you a question. I want to ask you when it came down to and I thought I was going to ask this about when you made the transition from the roller rink to the ice rink, which I still think is a great story because you did it so late in life, which how actually let me pause. How old were you when you decided to start ice skating, speed skating? 27. Sure. Who does that? <laughs> 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 and you didn't up. grow no, doing no, that. Yeah, that's no, crazy. I, I gave up. Nobody was ever going to figure out that I had any talent <laughs> at all if I didn't do it. Because <laughs> it's not an Olympic sport to be a roller rink speed champion. So you yeah. had to show them what you were. So 27, you get on the ice and then you end up winning a gold medal at 29, which is unbelievable. And I thought my question to you was going to be, what had to you know quiet down in your life for you to hear God in order to make that choice? But here's what I want to ask, and I think I already know the answer, but this is where the real story is. What had to quiet down in your life when you actually did accept God? Like, I know what happened on the podium, but you made a choice to get baptized. You made a choice to live your life as a Christian. So what had to quiet down in your life in order for you to hear the voice of God? Oh, man, honestly, for me, it was failure. It was... Wow. Always being able to win a race. And then the next chapter of life started. And I'd focus so much, like I said, on, on, on becoming the fastest skater in the world. And then I get thrown into a world that was so unfamiliar to me with no college degree, with a lot of skills that needed to be developed. And I had a complete identity crisis. Oh, that's fascinating. That makes a lot of sense though. Because nobody cared. Nobody cared yeah. anymore. If I went up to say I was the fastest skater in the world, that's, that's just, it, it's stupid, right? <laughs> it's just stupid. And, and yeah. that's the only value that I had in the world at that point. So for me to go and start businesses and fail business and fail in business and and understand, you know, what I needed to do and, and deal with losing, dealing with yeah. losing for dealing with losing. Yeah. I mean, it, I found the end of myself. Yeah. Right. And so when, when you do find this and I hope everybody can, and I know it, it sounds so crazy to say that, but I hope everybody can hit that, that wall, that, that wall that says, you know what? I can't do this on my own. Something bigger than you is out there. Correct. And the, and the failure was so loud that when I'm guessing when the failure quieted down enough and you were left with just you, that's when you were like, okay, voice yeah. of God. I mean, still to this day, talking to people like the friends that I have, you know, everybody had the typical college career or college years and, and they talk about it and I can't relate with it because I didn't go to college, right? Or, right. you know, or I'm talking and and maybe the attentiveness in comparison to what it used to be when I skated, people don't listen to me or maybe just mentally, I feel like people aren't listening and I have this, this social complex or anxiety because, because this transition has been so crazy, right? Right. And, you know, and... and as much confidence as I have, there are a lot of times where I have, I'm very, very awkward in public because I, I just have a different life. You do. And you spend a lot of your life. I mean, I'm guessing because your sport was an individual sport. You were alone. Like when I would see you on the rink, I mean, it's not like you're holding hands with people <laughs> skating around, Yeah. you know, it was a lot of you I'm sure. And coaches. But that's a lot of alone time, Chad. And I didn't think about that. I'm, my major was human development. And I'm thinking about these windows of opportunity 
like when we were growing up in school that you just didn't get to have because you were doing something else. And now as an adult, you're trying to go back and learn those lessons and those boundaries and those social cues. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's crazy, but to look back and I, I know we're, we're going to have like a lot of people from high school that maybe watch this and, and, you know, kind of reflect, but my life in high school was, was at times like, almost like looking back was almost a little sad to me because I couldn't invest in, in the people like I wanted to, and I couldn't relate with everybody like I wanted to, and I didn't have the time to spend, uh, spend time with them on the weekends. And it really affected my life. And my outlet was just to skate harder. Right. Just to do what you were doing even more. Yeah. And then you were just being more lonely and more segregated and, and more different than everybody else. And because of that, the, the trophy was my friend, the, the there trophy, you, go. you know, it, the trophy was your friend and now you're doing life. And you have these incredible, I would say your children are your trophies. You have these gorgeous girls, two little girls and a son with your beautiful wife. And so have you been able to find true success? Like now you have really lived the American dream. There's nothing more American than winning a gold medal for your country. But here you are and you can't win a gold medal every day. You know that better than everybody. Do you feel more successful today than when you were standing on that podium? In 06? Of, of course. I just feel like I'm so blessed. Uh, I feel like um, it's kind of crazy. I, I feel like the gold medal that I won has been a blessing, but also a curse in my life, right? A lot of people think that, you know, it, it comes with a lot of advantages, but the disadvantages are, are equal to the advantages. Um, but as far as my life today, I mean, I wouldn't be the man that I am. I, I, I was, I had a false sense of leadership as a, as a father, as a husband. Um, I was very, uh, I looked at being a parent and a, a, a husband as like being the hunter, right? Oh, I was, I was, yeah. the, I was the hunter and really there was no purpose for me in that role other than being the provider and the hunter that's interesting and so like i realized like i i didn't know how to develop real relationship because of you know the time that i had invested in just sport and you know there were a lot of things um that i needed to work on i have a daughter who's 11. i work on the relationship with her a lot because we butt heads. She's just like me. And, and <laughs> I often have to really, really dig deep to work on a relationship. I have to, to yeah. do the things as a husband that the Bible enlightens me to do that humans don't do on their own. Amen. So yeah, so you've had to go to that as well to learn. Chad, I think I, this is what I think is so great about you and why, I mean, I've adored you since we were in school there's always been something special about you and not just because about your sport, because here's what's great about your non-athletic friends. We're going to be impressed with no matter what you do. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I don't for care sure. how fast you are. I love your heart. I love your heart. I love what you've done with your life and the success that you have today. That's what I think makes you so worthy, you know, just being on this planet and you sharing you being a man of character and how you developed it on your own. That's an incredible story. You saw your life and said, this isn't working. I'm going to do something different. That's success. That's in my book. You're yeah. ridiculously successful. And, and, of course. And I think the word success is one that can really haunt a person. Um, exactly. I, I think, you know, we, we all know about the material stuff and, you know, the cars and the office and, and this and that. But at the end of the day, the word success, you, you have to get a good grasp on what that word really means to you and what the end of the road, what the, what the journey looks like and where you need to go to be successful. And I think we, you know, here today, we've kind of enlightened some people on really what, what that really looks like, because it's not about self. It's actually about opposite of self. 
Right. Exactly. And it's not about trophies. It's not about how much money you make. It's not about all these things, because at the end of the day, you and I know as believers, this is going to be over, right? Yeah. This whole little world is going to disappear. And it's not going to be worth anything. That's exactly right. That's ex- and, and God's not going to sit there and be like, oh, but Liv, you brought in no gold medals. So yeah. you go in this section. Otherwise, I'm screwed if that's true, Chad. Because And you know what? There's, pe- there's, pe- there's people watching that are going to accomplish their goal, that thing that they put their whole life into, that they may have sacrificed a relationship with a kid or they may have sacrificed a, a relationship with their mom or they may have manipulated people and, and used people along the way and they're going to get there and they're going to look back and they're going to be, oh crap, this just wasn't worth it. Wasn't worth it. Let me ask you, let me ask you one um, final question. Have you found this conversation that you and I are having something that does exist within other Olympians or other really high quote unquote successful people. Do you know what I mean? Every, every high performance business professional, every former athlete who's sensed any, anything close to the top of what they've done. Every one of this habit. So really God's put in my heart a really a way to connect with like, CEOs and business professionals and former athletes and really be able to give back to to really give them the cliff notes to Save give them. give them the end the last chapter of the book as they're reading mm. the book. I love that. I love that. Give them the last chapter of the book while they're reading the book and are they open to it? Have you found people to be open or it just I'm guessing depends on each person you come across? Everybody can relate with it. I love it. It touches the heart of everyone, whether they're ready to accept it and lay the guard down. That's a different story. And it's a, it's a process. It really is because people that are at the top of their game, top of their profession, they have everybody putting the microphone in their face, asking what they think about stuff. Um, you know, uh, bringing coffee to them, <laughs> you know, all, all these things. They're, they're you want for like nothing. Things. Yeah. They, they like where they are. They're, it's it's perfectly fine. Who wouldn't? Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's fantastic. I can't thank you enough for having this conversation. This is exactly so perfect for what I'm trying to do. And you were on my heart as one of the first people because I knew you would go there and share the truth. And I just want to thank you for this, Chad. Thank you so much for sharing your story and being open to exposing, you know, real life to everybody, being really real. So thank you. And if I ever get to to continue doing this, would you come back and talk to me again? Because this is just fantastic. Yeah, for sure. And if you're, it sounds like you're in the process of writing a book and <laughs> I... I actually have um, a pretty good connection to write a book and I, that's really on my heart. And if you're interested you in, in, in go, being a ghost writer or anything like that, maybe, <laughs> maybe we can work together. Listen, I'd love it. I love working with you. Tell me where people, not only in Houston can find you, but tell me where people can find you on the internet, social and your business. Drop yeah. a couple. Go ahead. Drop all the things, Chad. Yeah. Instagram <laughs> uh, at gold to sold, Chad. That's G O L D T O S O L D, Chad. Instagram. Gold to sold. Yep. Yeah. And um, all my properties, you can find them on YouTube. Uh, you can do Chad Hedrick on Facebook. You can go to gold to sold.com. That's our website. Uh, we're Perfect. doing real estate, all kinds of real estate here in Houston. I'm just offering my uh, work ethic, uh, my relentless work ethic to everybody and, and really learning how to uh, continue to grow in relationship through clients and real estate. I love it. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Hopefully I'll bump into you at the roller rink, maybe over the summer with, I don't know, all the crazy that's going on. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. All right, sir. Thank you. Bye. Bye. 
Thanks so much for listening to Talk to Me with Liv Harrison, the stories behind their success. Now, I got a little favor to ask. I need you to come back next week and listen to my next fantastic guest. The best way to remember is to subscribe. If you haven't already subscribed, take a second, take a moment and do that right now. And I really appreciate it. If you could even do me another solid, leave me a review. It's really important as I start off these first few weeks. I need your support. Share with your friends. Tell your colleagues. Make your kid listen. Okay, you don't have to make your kid listen, but subscribe, like, share, leave a review and come back next week. Thank you so much until you hear me again.